All right, I'm sure people will continue to join, but we'll go ahead and get started just to keep with time. Um, again, welcome. Thank you all for joining um, this workshop. Um, just a, a couple of uh, logistical comments before I pass it over to Debbie to uh, introduce the session. Um, we're using uh, the Zoom meeting function for this workshop. Uh, pretty straightforward. I'm sure you all are familiar with that. Uh, if you want to keep your video on so we can see you and um, you can you can uh, you're free to do that. Um, we'll try and make sure that all participants are muted during the presentations um, and I'll help control that. Um, when we're going to do questions at the end of all the sessions, so we'll have presenters go through and then we'll kind of open it up for uh, Q&A for everyone. Feel free during the sessions or along the way to submit your questions. Uh, you could do that using the chat function. Um, when we get to Q&A, uh, if you want to use the raise your hand function on Zoom, you could do that. Um, you can just turn your video on and raise your hand or unmute yourself and um, you can ask uh, presenters questions. So um, Debbie and I will help moderate that. Um, we are recording this so that we have it available later for members. Um, and I think that's kind of all the comments I have. So I'll pass it over to you, Debbie. All right, thank you, thank you. So um, just have my introduction, this is a session being sponsored by the North Carolina Muscadine Grape Association. It's part of a program funded by the North Carolina Wine and Grape Council. And it's one of a series of, of virtual sessions and uh, winery visits that we're calling the Muscadine Wine Make wine growers and winemakers quality enhancement program because our, our really our purpose in this is to help growers and winemakers do a better job create a better product um have better you know results and bottom line um and uh have great wines for the the wine drinking public um and support the industry as a whole so this is, we had a session back in June that focused on production. This is really the first that's mostly sort of wine and, and uh, wine grape oriented. Um, we will have, continue to have um, sessions every Wednesday throughout the rest of July. Um, and uh, so I'll say maybe say a little bit more about that, what's upcoming at the end. Um, but I wanted to just sort of quickly say what's happening today. Um, we have four presenters, um, if I got that right. Um, the first one, we'll hear from Mark Hoffman at NC State University. Um, then Nadia Hetzel, who is the winemaker at Cypress uh, uh, Creek uh, uh, Vineyard. Uh, and then uh, Renee Threlfall, who is with the University of Arkansas. Um, and works with a lot of uh, winemakers and growers out in that area. And we're really delighted to have her part of this. And then um, we'll also have Chuck Johnson, who um, is uh, with Shadow Springs Vineyard and Windsor Run Cellars um, in the uh, northwestern part of the state or north central, whatever. Um, and I'm really pleased that all four of you are able to be part of this and looking forward to what you have to say. So. Turn it back over to you, Kyle, to turn it over to Mark, I guess. So, Yeah, uh, Mark, I think you can uh, go ahead and share your screen and kick off your presentation. All right, thanks Debbie for organizing it. And thanks Kyle uh, for organizing this. So uh, welcome to the Muscat and Grape 2021 Berry Sampling Workshop organized, as Debbie said, by the Muscat and Grape Association, funded by the Grape and Wine Council uh, of North Carolina. And Kyle, who is my PhD student, is uh, so friendly and is again organizing and hosting this event, as so many before. And, um, and uh, I just wanted, I put it, I did put the agenda quick, quick into like writing so that you all know what's going on in the next couple of, uh, one, the next one and a half hours. So I, only would speak very generally for the next 10 minutes. Um, and then Nadia from Cypress Bend Vineyards will take it over. And then Rene from uh, University of Arkansas will, will talk, talk about uh, standard protocols for collecting your berry sampling. And then Chuck uh, will explain the services they offer. And then Nat we will circle back to Nadia after this. And then we do have like a short Q&A and, and wrap up 
um, at the end. And uh, Debbie is hosting all this um, and she will guide you through this agenda. I will be here if there are any problems. And of course, for the end of the Q&A, and um, I'm very glad that everybody is on and has the time, especially Renee. I know you're very busy. Thank you for having, like, um, for, for being here today. And, um, and um, I'm looking very forward to this. We talk about berry sampling today, most of the time. And um, with this, I'm going to start my presentation. I have been tasked with uh, the issue of explaining why it is important to do berry sampling. Um, and I'm pretty sure Nadia will talk much more about this later. Um, but I just want to give you like a quick overview of what, what I think is important, why we want to have to do this. And, uh, and really, I think if you do that frequently and if you do it, make it like a process in your vineyard every year that can improve the value of your business. And this is really what we want to do at the end, improving the value of our operations. So um, this is what I talk about today, mostly. Um, berry sampling improves value by adding a quality assurance uh, to your product, by, uh, but also by providing training to your staff and to your, and, 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 and to your customers if you do have a, a fresh market operation, and also by using newer technology. And we will talk about all those three things today in the next one and a half hours. We have speakers who talk about all those three things. I will just touch the surface here. Um, quality assurance. In the, in the processing vineyard, especially to determine the best harvest dates for your different cultivars, which you might grow for processing or for winemaking, uh, to schedule your harvester better based on average berry chemistry, and also to develop different wine styles in the long-term run. And again, Nadia will probably talk about this way more and has much more knowledge about this than I do. Um, and of, on the fresh market side, it's important to determine ripe versus unripe fruit. There are some cultivars which is hard to see directly if it's a ripe or unripe fruit. It also allows you to meet the standard bricks levels in the clamshell. Um, and also it allows you to train your crew if you have a wholesale operation or to train your customer to identify ripe versus non-ripe fruit. Um, on the training side, as I already mentioned a little bit in the processing uh, vineyard, uh, uh, operation vineyard managers and winemakers learn how to assess basic berry chemistry. Very important because they can work way closer together if you have those components which basically links them together. And then also you learn how to harvest, how harvest timing will affect winemaking as well. So those are two very important parts in the processing vineyard, in the fresh market vineyard. Um, if you have UPIC operations, you can train customers to identify ripe versus non-ripe grapes in some of those more critical cultivars. And you also can, and, and you also can uh, train your crew to pick the ripe grapes if you have a wholesale operation. Um, so those are all issues which are really important in a vineyard and berry chemistry and, and taking samples can help you uh, making a better product basically. Uh, technology helps a lot with this. Um, there are several areas of technology which we talked today. Handheld devices can be used to assess sugar levels. Most of you know those devices. Um, those are refractometers. And uh, then there's basic laboratory devices, pH meter scales, chemicals, which can be used to assess other basic chemicals like pH and TA. And that's Renee is gonna talk a lot about this. And then testing services are available. That's uh, Chuck will talk about this. Uh, which can be used to assess more, more of those chemistry parameters. And, uh, and, and again, we will hear about this more from Chuck later today. And with this, um, what does it mean for your business? Uh, I think quality assurance can lead to more competitiveness in the long-term run on the market and also may lead to more customers and may improve your revenue again, long-term. It's definitely something which is positive, can be positive for your business in the long term, on a long term scale. And um, for the industry at large, um, uh, it means that we can, that this can lead to like growth of your businesses, of good reputation of the industry, and also of an overall stronger industry in the long term run, if we do this more frequently and as a, um, on a yearly basis. And with that, uh, the usual resources which we have uh, for grapes, please look at those. We also just published a Muscadine production guide. Um, and then uh, 
I thank everyone for listening to me and I will shut up for the rest of this and let other people talk. And I'm glad to hear more from uh, Nadia. I give it to you. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, let's see, I'll try to share my screen now and see what we got here. One moment. Um, Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see here. All right. Okay, can y'all see my screen here? I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not the most. Yes. Okay, great. Here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about ideal harvest parameters. And this is from a winemaking perspective. So I'm the winemaker at Cypress Bend Vineyards. And I'm going to be focusing a lot on Carlos mainly in this presentation. So in an ideal world <laughs> and in theory, um, what you can do with some of the um, chemical parameters that we're going to be testing here during, during this program is you could plot them out on a graph and you would get something that would look similar to this. So say you had three samples that you sent off and you got results for them. You could plug them into like Excel or something. And in theory, you should <laughs> receive some kind of a graph like this. You should see as the berries start to soften that they, uh, drop in total acidity, which is one of the things you're going to be measuring with chemistry. And you'll also see that the sugar or the bricks are going to start increasing. And at some point, the total acidity as it, as it gets lower and lower and the sugar increases, you should have this point where the two cross. Now this point is kind of where we are really in the ripening phase physically. So we're gonna see our berries start to go from kind of that green sort of um, light green to kind of a, a deeper coloring. And then over here possibly we'll start to see more of those bronze to darker bronze uh, colorations going on with the berry and sweetness naturally is going to be increasing. And over here, you're gonna not really have so much flavor going on. It's gonna be relatively bland, but sweet. And you're just not gonna be picking up so much of your flavors. Then in this area, you're gonna start picking up those tropical fruit aromas, um, the pineapple and all that, all that great stuff that makes our fruit wonderful. And then over here, we kind of tend to drop off. Our chemistry starts to tank. And in other words, it starts to become less of a product that you would you know, possibly wanna make a wine out. You're gonna start getting an increase in foxiness an increase in those aromas. Your pH is gonna start increasing so much that it's going to be difficult later on when you're processing your wines to keep the wine protected with SO2. Um, your sugar is actually gonna to start to taper off around here at some point. And um, the total acidity is going to tank so much that later on, you're just gonna have more of a very kind of flat, flabby, unattractive wine. And so over here also, you're gonna notice with uh, muscadine, you're definitely gonna see a lot of the berries already starting to fall off the canopy pretty easily as well. So you're losing, um, at this point, you're losing uh, quality and you're losing your, the quantity of your harvest. So we're gonna look at this more on a numbers level now. Um, I've kind of broken this down into the chemical um, analysis that we're gonna be doing and the results you're going to be receiving and then broke it down into more physical attributes and then more from a flavor, aroma, texture profile like when you're tasting the berry with what sort of things you can expect. And this, I'm using Carlos as my example. So this is really where I'm, I'm, I'm coming from, but a lot of this does apply to some of the other varietals as well. Um, but generally speaking in the Southeastern North Carolina, we're seeing our bricks coming in somewhere around 12 to 15. Um, I, we've like seen our bricks come in like around 16 and so forth in certain years where there was, um, where we didn't necessarily use um, irrigation and the berries were a little bit drier. You, tended to get more bricks, but the juice yield was not so great necessarily. But um, 
generally speaking, I've spoken with a lot of people throughout the southeastern part of the state, and these are some of the numbers that we all kind of bounce around with. Then our pH tends to be somewhere pretty low, 2.8. Um, and honestly, we usually don't really get up to the 3.4 range at all. It's more like 3.2 or so. And so we're usually always on the good side of pH when we harvest, even if we're harvesting at higher bricks. Um, and then the TA, I've kind of put this one backwards because you're going to see an increase or a decrease in your total acidity. So usually, and this is in grams per liter. So you'll receive those results in grams per liter. So usually 8.2 is like a, a good number to have, um, theoretically speaking, but you're probably gonna wind up somewhere in the six to five range when you harvest. Um, and so those are kind of just some numbers thrown at you. You don't have to be 100% there. You make it other numbers naturally, but this is just sort of a guide just to give you a feel of that, of that area. And then, um, let's see. So then we are looking at our physical attributes. And one thing that's really prominent with muscadine, especially Carlos, is that yellowish sort of greenish pear color that we start off with. And if you harvest the majority of your berries like that, you're going to tend to have less aromatics, um, less of a advanced or very intense flavor profile. So if you like your wines to be a little bit more on the tart side, a little bit more um, sharp, then this is a good place to, to harvest them. You'll also find like a, a higher or a lower pH and a higher acidity at this point when they're still in a yellow green phase. Um, then it's going to deepen into a bronze color, like a darker bronze. It's almost like a really pretty red bronze color. So when the majority of your berries are at that point, you know you're in that good middle phase of, of ripening there. And that's probably the point you wanna consider, um, consider playing your harvest around. And then, you know, you start to develop these dark brown colors and it's not gonna be as pleasant anymore. That's when you're starting to drop off at the end of where you should be harvesting. You probably should, harvest more in this bronze area right here. Then the next thing you wanna try is you'll pull um, or just basically uh, touch the berries even on still the, on the um, rachis, just grab them and squeeze them. They're gonna start off being a little bit firm at first and then as they ripen, they're going to become more and more elastic as you squeeze, you can feel with your finger that they're, or your thumb, that they're really kind of yielding to pressure. And, and you'll go on to there, from there to a shriveled sort of thing. Um, and yeah, again, shriveled is also gonna yield yes, less juice as well as um, develop, development of chemistry is not going to be very great there. So your, your mouth feel, your flavor profile will probably have tanked at that point when you're seeing a lot of shriveled berries. Um, then the other point attribute is berry attachment. So how much resistance do you have when you try to pull one of the berries off of the rachis? So the point where it attaches the rachis to the berry, the pedestal, um, should basically yield very little resistance when you pull it. And um, however, it should still remain on the, the canopy and shouldn't, uh, if you were to like shake the canopy, they shouldn't just start all falling off right away. Um, so there should be very little resistance when you pull, but they should still remain relatively attached so that when you pick, and I don't know how everybody picks, everybody picks a little bit differently. We use a harvester, a machine harvester, and we have to make sure that we haven't waited too long to harvest. Otherwise the berries will basically just sort of uh, fall off. Uh, we call that shattering then. And they can totally fall off the head of the picker, which is a very sad moment for the winemaker. Um, so then you know you've waited too long as well as when you start to get that shattering on a large scale. So you can sort of uh, dial back your picker or um, there's beater bars on the side of your picker that are moving at a certain amplitude at a certain speed. And if you slow that down a little bit, maybe open up the distance between them, you have options there to kind of make sure you're not pulling off too many green berries, for instance, or that you're not, um, that you're not knocking things off ahead of the picker um, or hitting it too hard. So you have, you have ability to make adjustments there uh, when your picker is in. Um, and then we want to move on to seed color. So if you open up a berry and you get the seeds out, you'll see in the beginning, they're going to kind of have like a little streak of, of like a 
kind of a lime sort of chartreuse color to them, then we know we're kind of on the less riper side. But as it starts to ripen the berry, as it starts to develop that beautiful bronze shade of color to it, it's also going to get the seeds are going to start to darken up and take on this pretty brown color to like a very, very dark brown color when um, you've reached kind of the point where you maybe passed your point of, of harvest there. So we'll move on next to the flavor and aroma and texture attributes. Um, again, so we've done our chemistry, we've gone on to the physical attributes of it, and now we're going to talk about like tasting it, what sort of aromas to expect and, and you know, some of the texture when you're putting the berry into your mouth. And we're going to start off with the fact of just basically getting the berry to come out of, um, out of its shell. So the skin attachment, we're dealing with a slip skin variety, obviously with muscadine. Um, so you basically take the berry and you pop it into your mouth and how hard is it for that berry to come out of its shell? Um, that gives us an indication too of how ripe the berry is. It should pop out with complete ease once you've squeezed it into your mouth. Um, and again, we're looking at that uh, darker bronze color there. And um, yeah, so that's, that's just kind of dealing with the skin there and, and how it's advanced. Then the texture of the berry itself can be somewhat to like um, having a lower juice yield, being a little bit, um, a little bit, um, it'll be kind of chewy and so forth, but eventually starts to turn into kind of more of a gelatinous texture with more of a juice yield to it. So, and then as you progress, of course, and you've gone a bit too far, uh, you'll probably see that it becomes a bit slimy even <laughs> and that, um, you have less of a juice yield if the berries have started to, to dry. Um, now, for me, something that's really important as a winemaker, and if you're harvesting for uh, a winery, is the flavor profile. Um, again, if we start to harvest where it's too early and we're still seeing a lot of like light green, that kind of like pear colored berry, to um, uh, if we start to see more of that in, our, in what we harvest, then we know that we maybe should have waited a little bit longer. So those berries tend to have sort of a bland flavor. They're sweet, but they're a bit bland and they're, they're more acidic and have more of a sharp taste to them. And they have some aromatic attributes for sure, but what we're really looking for is that darker tan berry that's gonna have that richer uh, tropical fruit aroma. So we get usually notes that are like pineapple, peach, uh, very ripe pear. And then you know you may have gone and waited too long if you're starting to taste like guava or overripe papaya and you're starting to develop those, I, I don't necessarily like the term foxy, but yes, those more foxy notes um, and it becomes more uh, pronounced than, than, the, than the nicer, lighter aromatic flavors um, and, and uh, aromas there. So, that's like just a good guideline here. And I've kind of kept, this is my presentation right here. So basically, you know, you can take this with you if you need to um, have kind of an indication as you're going out and tasting berries and so forth. And then the seed flavor develops from being kind of unpleasant when you bite into it, um, almost like a tingling around your mouth to kind of a more pleasant, slightly pleasant nutty flavor because muscadine doesn't have the tannin that, um, that uh, vinifera does. So you can actually bite into the seeds and it's not going to be very unpleasant, actually. It's going to be quite, quite interesting. And then it starts to develop into almost like a granola situation, <laughs> almost like a crunchy uh, thing. So that may have been then where you waited too long. So again, these are, these are the th pretty much three important parts. There's more to it than just chemistry. There's also understanding what the berry, how it's developing. And that's incredibly important when you're harvesting. You don't just want to go on our chemistry numbers that we're gonna be talking about through these presentations. You definitely want to be looking at um, your, um, your other attributes of so the physical and the flavors. Very important if you're gonna be making wine out of, this, uh, out of your fruit. Um, Okay, so we'll just like review this again, but say we've got our total acidity in grams per liter and we've got like one, two, three, four plots because we've taken four different um, chemical tests. We're gonna talk later about that. That'll be in some other presentations about how to take your um, sample berries from the vineyard and how to get them to basically become juice that you later send off for sampling. 
but you're going to want to do about at least three samples total like throughout the ripening phase so that you get an indication of when in an ideal world the total acidity and the sugar have reached that optimum point and you've basically reached the point where you're in the in the ripening phase and you're in this area and again you don't want to be over here where you fall off the cliff with your chemistry so chemistry is very important as well but be tasting and be vigilant of the color and development of the flavor the berry flavors and profiles, and you should be very much on track. Now, another point is, you know, um, some people ask like, well, oh my gosh, I've got a lot of bronze or berries. Do we need to harvest right now? Like, will, how long, you know, do I have? And you should probably be harvesting within the next, you know, three to four days or so. You don't have to run out there right away and, and, and sort of um, jump on it. We kind of have an indication an idea over time of like when we hit that ripening phase. So we, we, we kind of base it off of past, um, uh, some, some past samples. And that's what you could do as well is start to develop a historical um, um, accumulation of your uh, sample information over time. That's gonna give you an indication of usually a rough idea of what window you're gonna be harvesting in from year to year. So it's a great tool to have to be um, on top of your total acidity and your bricks and your pH. And they're relatively inexpensive tools that you can gather yourself and have on hand. Um, and you'll see that as well, but you can also send your samples off and have them professionally, um, professionally looked at and then get your results, plot them out and you'll have this information here for you. So that being said, um, I thank you so much for your, your, um, for your attention and for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We all wanna make good wine together. Um, so happy winemaking and I wish you all a very happy harvest this year. And we'll talk again in a little while. So next we'll go on to, to Ms. Renee who's got an excellent uh, presentation for you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia. Thanks, Nadia. I'm getting my presentation up. Is it showing? All yep, right. Great. Well, good morning, North Carolina. How are you today? It's good to see everyone, uh, and uh, glad that people are willing to ready to learn about a little bit about. Um, protocols for collecting grape samples. So I'm a Renee Threlfall. I am at the University of Arkansas. I'm a food scientist. Um, so I have I'm coming at you more on the on that realm than anything. So what we're going to talk a bit about today is a little bit about grape chemistry. What oh there's a nice typo sampling supplies, um, sampling procedure and sampling analysis. So let's talk about the grape chemistry. And Nadia gave a kind of a good introduction. And I like the idea, Nadia just did her whole presentation on one slide. I, I, I do think that's really great that she covered like what happens to the chemistry. But I also think it's important to know what the chemistry means, like what is a soluble solids, what is a pH and what is a titratable acidity. I teach a class at the U of A called Uncorked Vines and Wines. And my class has business majors and, you know, just all sorts of people in it. And some of the people don't understand what a pH is. And so always start off with kind of defining these parameters to know why they're important. So when we're talking about soluble solids, we're really talking about the sugar content of the grape. So we're measuring that. Sometimes we say 8% bricks, sometimes we see it as percent soluble solids, but basically it's a measure of the percent of sugar in the, in the grape itself and, and as the major component. Now the pH is a measure of the acidity in the berry. And that's on a scale of a pH comes on a scale of zero to 14, where seven is water, just to give you an idea of what that scale means. And something like vinegar is a three. So wine is kind of in that vinegar range, but of course we don't want to make vinegar, right? When we're making wine, but we just to give you an idea of what that acidity level is. And then we have titratable acidity. And titratable acidity is different than total acidity. Total acidity is a measure of all acids, but when we typically measure in the wine industry is called titratable acidity, and that's a measure of the predominant acid in the grapes, which in our case uh, is tartaric acid. 
And so that's what we're going to be um, kind of just a background on those numbers. So what are some of the kind of the standards? I did include wine grapes here because I know a lot of growers aren't just muscadine. They may have more than uh, one type of grapes. And um, so these, these standards vary by cultivar. They, they definitely vary by year. And that's where, like Mark said, the taking the records and keeping these for records really come in handy because you know, as you're taking your initial chemistries at Verasion, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have that kind of year. I think I had that kind of year in you know 2010. So you have an idea. So for, you see the wine grape numbers there. I'm not gonna really go over those, but the muscadine grape numbers, what we're seeing, and I think Nadia had some similar numbers here uh, in terms of the soluble solids or bricks is about 50, uh, somewhere 15 to 20, it depends on your region. Um, and then a pH of three to 3.5. I didn't put a TA number there, but what Nadia said is pretty true in terms of the, the values there that you would see for a TA. So um, you're gonna harvest. Um, and then one thing to consider is that sometimes you have to make a decision about whether it meets the parameters and how is the quality of the fruit looking. So at some point during the growing season, you know, it may be that you've got a, a downy mildew problem or uh, maybe a, a hurricanes are coming or something like that. And you've got to make a decision about, about the quality goals you're trying to attain, but also bringing in a crop. And so what are the sampling supplies that we're going to be kind of talking about? Most of the growers probably use uh, some type of refractometer to measure the soluble solids. And so in the image here you see is a handheld refractometer, which uh, Debbie is, uh, I believe, going to talk about later that we're giving, I think we're giving all of the growers that are participating in the, the meeting. And it's a pretty simple piece of equipment. Then we um, typically, we could also have a pH meter. These you can buy on Amazon. You can buy all the, like these two pieces of equipment easily on Amazon. I will say on a pH meter, um, the more digital it is uh, and a little more expensive it is, probably the better quality it's going to be in terms of how well and accurately it measures a pH. And then um, we also can measure our titratable acidity. It's a little more complicated, but it's it's very doable for a home a home type winery lab. That's a smaller lab. It does take these pieces of equipment. You need a pH meter, some type of burette to deliver the sodium hydroxide, some kind of stir plate, um, and that's kind of what you need. And maybe some beakers. But even in that picture, you hear you see here instead of a beaker, they're using a Pyrex uh, jar, a Pyrex. Uh, uh, measuring cup. So something like that would work. So other supplies that come in handy for sampling would be any kind of zip top freezer bag. I prefer the ones with the actual zipper because I never seem to be able to get my other ones sealed properly and I'm always like spilling juice on myself. Uh, then you can have beakers or just use plastic cups like a solo cup or a Dixie cup. I will say if you're using plastic cups or paper cups, you have to be careful when you're measuring pH because it doesn't, uh, the pH meter doesn't really stand up very well in a paper cup. It kind of tends to flip over the cup. You need DI water, which you can buy in, by the gallon or more in a grocery store. It helps to have, um, uh, when I go to the vineyard, I typically have a little setup on like a harness where I have a little DI flask like you see in the picture and I maybe have a, some paper towels tucked in somewhere where I could do things in the field. Uh, and then dispo disposable pipettes work very well also. They're like little bitty pipettes that you can throw away when you're done. So those are some super handy things to have in the lab, but also to take out to the vineyard with you when you're sampling. I do want to talk a little bit about the refractometer and how it works, but basically if you look at the picture, it kind of gives you an idea. You see the straw, but it looks, the straw looks kind of bent because it's re refracting uh, as you're trying to look at it through the water. And depending on if you have water or salt water or sugar water in the cup and different levels of sugar, that refraction changes. And that's basically how a refractometer works. So how do you use the handheld refractometer? So you're walking in the vineyard. So the first of all, it's, there's, no, um, there's no battery or anything. It's typically um, use the sunlight uh, as your source of light. So you um, open up the, the um, you can kind of see the, um, the refractometer here in the top picture. You're gonna open up the, the little uh, 
measuring port. You're going to put a drop or two. Don't overwhelm it. It just takes like two drops of, of a berry. And you're going to then close the port. And then you're going to look through the eyepiece. And you, there's going to be a scale. And you can see an example of the scale here uh, that you have kind of a, a delineation between a dark line and a light line. So a light part and a dark part. And where those meet, that line is the measurement. So in the case of this, is somewhere between like right around 16 and 17 percent. And that's simply how it works. Now, one thing I think a mistake people make is not not cleaning off their refractometer between samples because it just takes a drop to measure it. So if you don't clean it very well between samples and dry it, then you're going to have mistakes in your measurement. So we want to rinse that with your little DI water flask that I had in the last picture and then kind of pat it dry with a very soft paper towel. In, um, in a lab, we use Kim wipes, which is uh, keeps from uh, basically scratching that, that glass prism or receptacle on the measuring thing. So cleaning off the, the refractometer is very important between uses. And so what does the sampling procedure look like? And I think Nadia mentioned you need to sample about three to four times before harvest. And I like to start at at Verasion, and she explained Verasion basically, or Verizon, where everything kind of starts to soften, and the in the red grapes they start to change color. So you're going to have that that intersection of all those chemistries where everything's really starting to change. And it'll give you a good baseline to even look at a prediction if you have a couple of years data of when your harvest might occur. So you want to do it at Verasion, maybe. Uh, Two to, two, two to three weeks before the expected harvest, one day before expected harvest, and two days before the expected harvest. And so how, how do you do the early sampling? And I divided this into early sampling and closer to harvest sampling because early sampling really at Verasion, you don't need to take 100 to 200 berry samples if you don't need to, because sometimes you may walk out there at Verasion and some of the berries are still hard as rocks and you can't even get a drop of juice out of them. If that's the case, you don't even really need to sample because you know it's not, not ready. But just walk down the, the, let's say you have a block of uh, Carlos you call block one Carlos that you usually harvest all at the same time. So you want to think of that whole block and uh, sample about you know uh, 10 different locations in that vineyard, uh, pulling samples from the shade, from the sun, from different parts of the clusters. And then record those average soluble solid levels so that you can keep the record of just the soluble solid levels at, that, at those maybe first two early sampling dates. And so as you get closer to your particular predicted harvest, you want to kind of increase your uh, number of berries that you're collecting so you get a better representative sample of the whole vineyard. Um, the what I find when I do sampling, um, when I get sample numbers from growers, is that I usually, usually what I, it, it happens is the, if let's say the number of the soluble solids is like uh, 18, um, actually, in reality, when the when the lot comes in, it's usually a degree or two less than that, uh, because sometimes we just don't uh, work very hard to get in and out into the vines to get the proper sampling that we need. So you want to if, if you have a, um, a sampling procedure, I like to think of I'll show my age here by show, talking about Looney Tune character, the Tasmanian devil. So the Tasmanian devil just kind of willy nilly runs around and collects kind of um, samples in the vineyard, not really thinking about where you're pulling from. So you start at the beginning of, of one of your rows and on the side, just kind of walk, take a couple of steps and then reach in and, and collect from a, a shoulder of a berry. I'm using a, a vinifera grape as an example, but even, even uh, some uh, muscadine clusters have a shape as well. So kind of the top part of uh, the shoulder of a cluster, take a couple of steps, Grab a, reach in, grab a berry from the middle, grab a berry from, um, from the tip or the end of a cluster. And then take, an, take a few steps, depending on the row length, and then do the same thing again. So the number of steps can vary between the sampling zones, and you want to vary that location of, that you're getting from the clusters. That's the key. You don't want to be send your workers out there and they're just getting all the ones in the sun, because then your numbers are going to be off probably a good 5% if you do that. And so collect the samples in some type of zip bag. So I just send, I send my 
my students to the vineyard and uh, with Ziploc bags, uh, sometimes pre-labeled, uh, you know, Carlos block one and the date on the bag. And uh, they put the, the samples in the bag and then they uh, bring them back. But be sure to label label the bag so that if they're doing multiple samples in a day, when you come back, you're not trying to figure out which plot they were in. And then in terms of the sampling analysis, what we're going to need is to collect the juice. So we're going to seal the bags. We're going to basically squeeze the 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 berries from the outside of the bag so we don't get any our hands dirty we don't do anything like that and then you can use cheesecloth and pour the berries and mixture into the cheesecloth but really if you have a big enough juice sample all you really need to do is drain off juice from the bag and uh, pour it into your receptacle your beaker or your cup and so then we're going to in the lab with the bigger sample we're going to measure more of the things we're going to do the soluble solids you want to take a take a drop of the juice and put it on the refractometer and, and measure the soluble solids and then we have enough to do a ph meter measurement here as well and probably a titratable acidity measurement too uh, it usually only takes about five milliliters to do a t a ta and it takes about probably um 10 to 20 milliliters to do a pH because you have to have the pH meter probe thoroughly covered in the beaker. So there's some good images there of what you would be doing with those, those samples. And then, you know, um, keeping these, like Mark said, keeping these records are really great to plan your future harvest. And one thing we, we all know, and we, we have to remember if, if you are a grape grower is that the quality is made in the vineyard. Um, and that that is why this is so important because uh, as a winemaker, we can do a lot of things to fix some problems, but if the problems are really severe, you know, underripe fruit, it's, it makes it harder on the wine end. That's why, you know, your, when you have grower contracts, you maybe have certain soluble solids levels that they are asking you to meet um, for their criteria for wine production. And again, that's all from me. And I will answer questions at the end when we're done. Thank you guys. Awesome. And Thank I'm you, Renee. Um, I'm going to go ahead and. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We have Chuck Johnson next, who is uh, from Windsor Run Cellars. Um, so Chuck, let me pull up your presentation. Um, and then once that's sharing, you can get started. There we go. Can you see that? Yep. Uh, I'm not as technical savvy as uh, everybody else is, so I'm having Kyle do mine. Um, I'm Chuck Johnson, co-owner of Windsor Run Cellars and the Shadow Springs Vineyard. We are a uh, vineyard in the Yakin and Swan, Swan Creek uh, AVA. Uh, we do have an IFR, but uh, um, I've been a part of the council for a while and uh, interested in helping North Carolina grow and the quality. So next slide. We, are, we have a machine that we purchased and um, we are interested in testing samples, not only for our own vineyards, but for other vineyards in the state of North Carolina, both uh, uh, muscadine and vinifera. What we're, why we're testing is, like you've heard, is we're trying to understand the juice chemistry, but we want to make sure we know what is in the juice before we bring it into the winery. We wanna use this data to make great wine. And uh, we wanna see the, see the trends, what, what, what's happening, what's happening year to year. Hopefully we can collect this data and share this data uh, for the industry. Other options other than using our machines, and we'll talk about that later, is you can send these to commercial labs. There are several out there, ETS, Virginia Tech, um, have commercial labs. They charge anywhere between 60 and 120 for a juice panel. One of the things that we found is turnaround time is, is, is an issue. Usually we send it there and usually two to three days, we get it back. The problem is, is when you have this and you're trying to make harvest decisions or you're trying to make wine decisions, if you wait that long, it could be too late. Um, so turnaround time is super important. Another thing that a commercial lab does for you or doesn't do for you, we can't collect North Carolina data. Uh, our, our deal is we wanna try to collect the North Carolina data and share that data uh, later. 
So next slide. So why Enofoss? Uh, Enofoss is a machine that we purchased and it was $42,000. Why in the world would a small winery like me purchase $42,000 machine? We think it's that important that we know where our chemistry numbers are and we do wet chemistry. We have a, we have a lab on site and we, we've done that. But the speed of this machine and the accuracy of this machine is just something that we feel is worth it. Um, but we're also trying to help the industry as well. Um, we do collect a fee for this, not quite as much as what they're, what they're doing, but other labs are doing, but we're trying to help the industry and we're trying to uh, um, make sure that we, we have a, the right, uh, right thing we're doing. The cost of this grant, when Debbie came to me and asked me about this, uh, we, we said, how can we get people to participate? Well. You do it for free. That usually helps. So for this grant and what they're doing, we are performing this chemical analysis of the juice for free. The grant is paying us, but, but for you, it's free. Uh, cost of wineries outside this grant, outside of North Carolina, we're doing a special rate of $45. Benefits. Accuracy. You can use a refractometer um, and you can use different uh, home lab equipment to do this, but accuracy is, is critical. You have to make sure you got the right numbers. Turnaround time. We want to turn this around as quickly as possible. We are committed to doing this as fast as possible. If you bring a sample into us and hand deliver it, we guarantee it within an hour the results. If you UPS it into us, we're going to give you the results as within an hour after we get the we get the sample. If we're having to thaw it out, it may be the next day. But we will be a lot faster than any other lab that you could send it to. Also, collecting data for North Carolina. We are looking to collect the data and everything that we take, we want to make sure we're sharing to the universities, to, uh, to the different uh, fields and make sure that we're comparing. Now, it's not our intention to put names on any of this data. We're not looking to single out farms or single out vineyards or single out operations. What we are looking to do is to try to get an analysis of the general population. Uh, we will probably sort it out by uh, regions uh, so we can get temperature differences and timing of when the samples are, but it's not. We're not, we're not trying to single out anybody, but we want to be, make sure that the uh, data is available for, um, for the universities and for the other people to decide is, are we doing the right thing? Are we harvesting at the right time? What, what, what is the issues that, we, that we're facing? So uh, next slide. So what I've got here is a demo. If you want to hit that um, um, uh, screen, Kyle. Let's hope it comes through okay because I didn't optimize for sharing video, but let me know if you can, I don't know if there's sound to it. So just let me know and we can switch. Basically what we're doing here is um, we've got to spin this, uh, the juice sample. And if you see that this is a small uh, juice sample that it uses, but basically this is a, a spin method so we can get the solids towards the bottom of the sample because the, we, we're looking for only the juice sample. So this machine will spin it uh, and give us clean juice on the top. If you look on the right of the slide, this is the machine. Uh, this, uh, the, blue doc, uh, the blue thing is the machine and uh, the Enofoss, and then that's connected to a, a, a laptop that is collecting the data. So if you look, Kevin is, uh, is loading, and we're only talking about two to three milliliters of uh, juice in here. Um, so he's loading the juice in. And uh, this works through a spectral light, so uh, it shines uh, lights through this to do the measurements. Uh, and it's very quick. Um, we can do this in about a minute. Uh, the, the samples come back.
So the video is a little slower than what I thought, but again, one minute later, we will have the results of our um, sample. So we are labeling them. Uh, so we will label them and code them uh, so we can use them again in data to help the industry. Uh, it'll work. Huh. You push the next uh, slide, Carl. Uh, maybe go to the next one. Okay. When you when we get the samples back, we will email you these um, these numbers: total acidity, pH, bricks, tartaric acid, and yan which is uh, yeast assumable nitrogen. What we're using that for is we wanna know what kind of nutrients we need to add to, the, add to the juice while it's fermenting for wine. So all of these, you will get a number back um, and an accurate number. Uh, and we will retain all that um, again and, and do a comparisons at the end of the year. But these numbers will be emailed back to you uh, and very quick. So a winemaker, when they get this information, they'll know what to expect um, when, they, when they're looking at harvest, what's coming into the winery, and um, it will all be there. Next slide. If you have questions, um, and we, we're going to do questions at the end, please ask me. I am the owner, not a winemaker, so bear with me. Um, the um, my phone number, the winery number, 336-468-9274, or you can always get me on my cell, 970-3431. Check out Windsor Run is my uh, email address. What we want to make sure, and, and we'll go through the pr uh, protocol for sending this to us, but we need to know what's coming. Our UPS person is usually around 5, 4.30 to 5 o'clock. So if we know a sample is coming, usually... Uh, overnight on UPS anywhere in the state. So if we know a sample's coming, we will wait for it. Um, but if we don't know it's coming, it'd be hard. And I'm not gonna wait around there all night for if, if, if I'm not gonna get a sample. So please, if you have a sample coming to us and you ship it UPS, tell us and give us a tracking number so we can track it. Uh, our goal is, like I said, to turn around this as soon as possible. If you, if you decide to drive a sample up to us, please call me and let me know when you're going to be there. And uh, we'll probably, if we're not super slammed, we'll run the sample while you're there. But by, by for sure, within the next hour to two, we will have this run and get a sample back to you. The, the machine takes three minutes and we can get the sample. It's just getting the time to run everything. But we, we, we guarantee that we'll have this information back to you when you can use it. That's it. So I think we're going now to Natalie, back to Natalie. Yeah, yep, Nadia, we're moving on to your presentation. So I'll let you share yours again. I think there was one question for Chuck um, uh, to explain the importance of yarn for the growers. If you can do that quick before we move on to Nadia. Um, yarn uh, is really, uh, it's not for much for a grower, but more for a wine winery. We want to know what the um, yarn is so we can prepare count, uh, additions to that. That's another critical thing that has to be done that you need to do almost immediately. If you get a juice sample in, or if you start crushing uh, uh, in the winery, you need to know what the, what the nutrients that you need to add to this as soon as possible. Uh, if you let this thing start fermenting without the proper nutrients, um, that's a problem. And to make great wine, that's why we have this machine and that's why we're offering to the industry in a fast method. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Chuck. Nadia, you wanna go ahead? Sure, so I'm gonna do my best to get this presentation up here. Let's see here, I'm gonna have to go ahead. Um, okay. Oh, okay. 
okay? So we've had some really great information so far about how to gather your samples. So Renee told us about the 100 to 200 berry sample that we need to get the juice that we're going to then take and send off to Chuck for his analysis. Um, I'm just gonna review some of that. So when you do take your berry samples, and again, this is obviously not muscadine here in this picture. Muscadine is going to probably fill this bag pretty decently, whereas the berries here are pretty, pretty small, being vinifera. Um, but you want to label each one of your bags with your sample ID. So the sample ID is basically your, for your own purposes so that you can identify which vineyard or plot the sample came from. And you just want to uh, definitely take that down and write that across your baggie for each sample that you take. And that's going to follow your sample all the way through from juice to, um, to your data that you results that you get. Right. So basically, like Bernie said, you're going to take those berries into the lab and just squish and squish and squish. And you can just sit there and watch some Netflix or something while you're squishing your bags and yielding all that juice. And again, she um, she told us about the green berries. You know, you don't necessarily even need to add them while you're sampling. But if you happen to. And I've included this information because I've had several people ask me this before, is those green berries, they're so hard, they're not even going to, you know, don't try to sit there with a hammer and smash them up and everything. Later on, when you actually get some of those in your bin when you're harvesting, those are likely going to drop out at the crusher to stimmer anyway. They're going to be kicked out and um, they're not going to even press when they do get to the press. So they're totally negligible. We don't need to worry about them. Um, so again, you're squeezing your berries, getting that juice out. And what I tend to do, everybody has their own little, you know, routines that they develop with their samples. Um, my personal favorite is to kind of cut the edge of the bag down here, kind of like a, use it as a, um, like a little baker's uh, thing, you know, like when you're making a cake and you're decorating it, <laughs> just kind of squeeze it up like that and get the juice to come out. And usually I'll do it over a strainer that's sitting over my my beaker then, and I'll just yield that juice out. Now the important thing about your sample, if for, um, for Chuck's purposes, we need to have 50 milliliters of juice collected to send off to, to Chuck. So this might look something like the sample container that you'll have. And if I'm not mistaken, we're gonna talk about that later, but you may be able to get some through this program uh, for your sample collection. And we'll hear about that here in a little bit. Um, so yeah, collect 50 milliliters of juice. And again, you could pop that through a strainer to, to get it a little bit. It's not, it's still gonna be cloudy. You're not gonna have like perfectly gorgeous clear juice. And then put your label on there that um, your sample ID on your um, label container here. Make sure that you've got that written out for each sample. Um, so you know exactly uh, which sample that is later on. That's again, gonna follow it all the way through to testing. Um, okay, and this is the form that you're going to receive later on. Um, and you're going to mail this form off with your samples. So of course you're gonna fill it out here. You're going to put down the date that you sampled because you need to follow that data very closely. Um, so that later on, you know, when the berry was at what ripening stage, of course. And then you write your grape variety on there. Uh, if you're sending more than one variety or if you're sending more than one uh, sample at a time, make sure that you include on this line down here all the sample IDs that you have going in there so that they can be traced to the little, the little cups there that we got. Um, so, and then you'll put on there if it's part of the program, you'll check that. If it's part of the program, the cost is covered by the Muscadine Growers Association um, very, uh, very generously. And, <laughs> and if not, then put down that you're gonna be paying for this testing sample. And then any notes for Chuck that you wanna add there um, at the bottom. Um, okay, let's see. And now for mailing instructions, what to do with those samples once you've got it. So if you're experiencing a delay in shipping, like you can't send it the very same day, um, you probably want to consider freezing your sample so that it doesn't start fermenting on its way up to Chuck, because that would then be uh, a voided sample. You probably aren't going to get results out of it. 
And if so, it's not going to be the results you're looking for. So make sure that if you can't ship it like right away, um, freeze that sample, especially like if you're going to have to wait till close to the weekend to send it like on a Thursday or something, um, there's a possibility it could get hung up in a warehouse or something, or, you know, it might just not make it in time. So you definitely want to, to try to pick a day early in the week to send that sample up there. And again, freeze that sample if you can't send it up there right away. Um, yeah, so take each one of your sample uh, cups there and pop them into a Ziploc bag so they don't leak all over the place. And then get some uh, bubble wrap if you want or something to insulate it, especially if it's frozen, uh, that'll keep it nice and, and safe for the trip up. Um, and unless of course you're driving the, the samples up as Chuck said, and then you just let him know. Uh, again, very important, let Chuck know that your samples are on the way. And here's his email, but again, here's his contact information. Um, give him a call, let him know the samples are coming um, and uh, let him know that they're, they're coming to him so you can get your results right away as well. All right, so that was my presentation. And um, now we'll, we'll be talking about the program and, and getting the samples done. Okay, nope, sorry about that. Okay, so that was that. And, oops, <laughs> I'm sorry, Kyle, what do I need to do now? <laughs> I feel like I'm stuck here. <laughs> okay, there we go. Did, it, did that stop? Okay. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right, I think. David. Yeah, I think we're moving into our um, Q and A, and um, there were a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, the first question was, and that's probably for Nadia and Chuck. Um, do we need to put the name of the winery on the sample cup if they are sent in? And I have a, a question which uh, goes with that, not just the name, but also the date when the sample was taken. Does that need to go only on the sheet or does it need to go on the cup as well, especially if there are more cups than one percent? We would like it on the cup as well so we can match the samples. If you have two samples in there in two pages, we don't know which, which sample came with which um with, with which uh which one of okay. which okay all right so uh on the sample cup if you if you choose to to send a sample on the sample cup there should go your uh, name or the winery name the date when you were sampled was sampled what cultivar was sampled and then the acreage of the vignette i believe was on that cup as well so is that correct or do i miss something here you know, I mean, uh, that's a lot to write on a cup, but but it, if we could make sure that we're designated, I mean, if you're sending the, the, the paper along with it, if you said sample one and wrote okay. sample one on the cup, um, there's, there's a lot to write on that. So just make sure that we know when we get it, uh, which is which, if you send more than one. Obviously, if you send one, that's not a problem. If you send four, please make sure that you're writing on permanent marker so it doesn't go away if, if, if it gets, if it starts thawing out or whatever. Um, so we know which one it is, but yeah, that's a lot to write on the cup, but just make sure that you make, know that we, we know which one it is. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes full sense. Um, and then there was a question, uh, I just want to follow up on, on YAN. Um, YAN stands for yeast assimilable uh, nitrogen, which is always a hard word for, for German to say. <laughs> um, um, and that neat nitrogen is critical for fermentation and, and, uh, and uh, yeast growth in the juice and also for the completion of fermentation. And it can, yeah, if, you, if your yen levels are not correct, it can lead to like uh, things which you call like reduction reduction, or something in the, in the wine. And Nadia knows more, much more about this than I do. And Rene probably knows much more about this than I do. But um, uh, it's good information to have for people who, who actually want to make wine out of the grapes. Rene, do you want to follow up on this? 
Yeah, um, I think one of the questions I think on a grower end is can can we impact yan by adding nitrogen in the field? I mean, yes, there are studies that show that nitrogen in the soil does impact yan in the fruit. Um, and I know Mark could probably give a whole seminar on that, but that's one of the things that it is important. It actually, uh, it helps a, helps a winemaker if the, the nitrogen, the new, just imagine if you were um, going to, if you were a yeast and you wanted to be happy and you were put in water with nothing in it, no nutrients or anything, no sugar, no no nitrogen. You're gonna the, the yeast don't survive well, and so that's the point. Is the yeast need nitrogen and sugar to reproduce and do a proper fermentation? But another thing on the winery side is if you don't know that, you don't know that your your yeast needs needs something. Um, you could be overstimulated or understimulated, and and that's a problem on both sides. So. One of the important data is that we wanted when we bought this machine was yen. We we got to know what the yen is. We got to know we're adding proper nutrients, not just well. I think it needs it, so we just do it. Yeah, and I'll add to Chuck's note on his unit. Um, yen, uh, can you do yen on your own in your winery? Yes, but it's a, not an easy method to do. You can buy these kits that are not very accurate, but they do require a spectral photometer to do. Um, but the, the better procedures take longer and some of them even use like formaldehyde and chemicals that you don't even wanna be messing with. So it is a not an easy, it's not like pH where it's easy to read. Yep. All right, one, um, one kind of uh, cheat trick <laughs> that I use as a winemaker is if I come into the cellar and it smells like like rotten eggs, or it smells like like our our uh, facilities manager always comes in and says, "Yeah, it smells like stinky socks." <laughs> then I'm like, "Oh, the yeast is stressed. Um, you know, we've got to add some nutrients to it and whatnot." But to have that number, you can actually take that number and calculate how much more nitrogen you need to add. And um, I don't mean to to throw a plug out there, but I'm gonna do this anyway. If you go to the Scott Labs uh, fermentation handbook, in there is a really great tool of how to do a calculation based on your yen number of how much um, certain nutrients to add and they can guide you along as to what kind of a nutrient program you can use. Um, diammonium phosphate is often used as the source of nitrogen, but it's a very, um, it's a very questionable source because it's not, is not like nutrients. So it's like, you know, feeding your kid cheeseburgers all day long instead of giving them a balanced meal. And so in order to get that kind of balance of uh, what, um, what nutrients to add, you can use that. That is a really great tool from Scott Labs. And yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll give the shameless plug too, because um, I'm a Fermade user, which is a, a product that is a nutrient product. And I have not had a stuck fermentation since I started using Fermade. So, or a nutrient. So. Yeah, Fermate is outstanding. That's true. We use it as well. <laughs> but the trick is, the sooner you know, the better. True. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you could avoid like doing the smell test basically if you use your your samples. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. Thank that was great. I have a couple of other questions. I so and, and please feel free, everyone who has a question, just like open up the mic, ask a question, or put it into the chat box if you don't feel comfortable talking. Um, but I wrote down a couple of other questions over the time of this seminar. And um, the first one goes for you, Renee. Um, the question is just, that's very, that's good. So my, my question is how, so with the ref, with refractometer use in the field, how important is the outside temperature, if you want to Oh yeah, that. that's a good point, Mark. Yeah. Um, so uh, typically, typically you want your juice to be room temperature at the measurement that you're taking. And I know that's not possible in the vineyard. So if you are sampling, it's better to do it in the cooler part of the morning in the summer, where it's like 70 to 80, rather than in the heat of the afternoon, you know, when it's 90s to 100, and you're picking a berry that's in the sun, it's definitely going to be a lot uh, impact the measurement as well. Hmm. Right. Good point. And the same thing about too cold. So if you refrigerate your sample for some reason, you don't get to it in time, you need to let it get up to room temperature around 70 to 
75 degrees before you measure it on a refractometer. And a, a little bit more on the refractometer, we showed you the basic refractometer. There are digital refractometers and there are better uh, lab scale refractometers that you can purchase um, to do more accurate measurements uh, in your lab. Okay, thank you, Renee. Mm -hmm. um, and then Nadia, I have like a question for you. I really have two questions for you. You're not off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the first question is, uh, on the records which you take, which you keep on your berry sampling every year, how informative are those to your uh, winemaking process or to your to your harvesting process? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. It's it's very much um, year after year when you maintain that information. It does kind of narrow your window of when you can harvest. So it's really really important to have that and maintain it. And we, um, we definitely set our harvests based on previous, uh, previous uh, indications there from that. So you, you want to keep really good records. You want to keep it like in a separate place where you can always refer to it. And uh, then you can, you can make sound harvest decisions based on that information. So it means a lot. It definitely mm -hmm. does. And do you see a lot of difference between the cultivars you guys are growing? We do see uh, with Magnolia. So we grow Magnolia, Noble, and Carlos. Mm -hmm. And we see the Magnolia always ripening much earlier than the Carlos. So we definitely have to get like our picker usually out a week ahead of Carlos. And then Noble tends to be um, towards the end of our harvest. We kind of, I would say like about a week after we harvest our Carlos that we're going after the noble then. And we really like the deepening flavors and, and the structure of flavor and aroma that's coming out, out as we let, you know, we're not like letting it hang like in Bordeaux or whatnot, but we are like letting it develop its, its true characteristics and aromatics. So, and that, that to have that chemistry information is a real, real important mm -hmm. aspect. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that, that's very helpful. And then a follow-up question on this. Um, so you talked about uh, how how important it is to take to to like do like flavor testing in, in the vineyard, especially if you get closer to harvest. Um, and you said with the Carlos, you have like this flavor which just goes from like a, a pineapple and ripe peach kind of flavor to like an overripe flavor. And I I can see that this is this transition is going pretty fast actually. So is there how how far if you if you want if you go let's say you go for like a uh, uh, a really ripe peach flavor. How far away are you from the overripe kind of papaya flavor? How big is your window there? Do you kind of know that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I don't want to be too precise there because I don't want to mislead right, anybody right. because it, there's some vagary there as well. But um, generally, like um, within three to four days, you mm -hmm. want to start to start pulling and you're going to see a transition in coloration of your berries throughout the canopy, if you're looking at them as a whole. And I love the picture behind you, uh, Mark, because it gives us a really good indication. Actually, actually from your vineyard. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally super, <laughs> that's very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see the difference in variation of, uh, of ripening there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, you know, actually looking at this, I might wait just a little while longer because I see a lot of lighter green berries, right, right. but some of them are transitioning towards an overripeness there in the back. But those may be berries that were perhaps even damaged or, um, you know, for some point or another, they've, they've become a little too, too ripe. Right. And, um, but overall, I'm seeing there that we should wait a little while until they're getting more of a bronze color. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe about three to four days that they start to transition beyond. Yeah. Um, where they need to be. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, there's one question in the chat. Um, uh, the question is, so Chuck is asking if anyone has, uh, oh, that's a good question. If anyone has, uh, if there are any differences between uh, female and self-fertile cultivars, Renee, probably you can answer that in chemistry. I don't know if you can. I can't. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, that is, that is a good question. And I un honestly don't know the answer of it because our breeding program here, we're trying to do um, uh, not very many females anymore. So uh, if John Clark were on, he could definitely answer that question better. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I, Nadia, do you have female and male no. or female plants? No. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure there are differences between cultivars. I mean, we, we touched on this a little bit, you know, but if that has to do with this, uh, with, with, with female or self fertile, we, we can't answer that question. Um, all right, one more question on my list, which is for Chuck Johnson. Chuck, can we use your service for research too? Sure. <laughs> Good. Because sure. we, ha we have some experimental wines in the vineyard and I would really like to know chemistry there. So yeah, no yeah. problem. Yeah. Cool. We, we, I mean, we plan to roll this out as a wine uh, tester too, as far as QAP is concerned, both for the muscadine side and for the vinifer side. So uh, it will be available. We're working on QAP parameters right now, um, but um, that that's that's the goal. We want to try to help North Carolina and uh, make great wine. That's our goal. Okay, cool. Thank you. Kind of a follow-up question for you, Chuck. But um, what are the and I guess maybe this is for the whole group. But what uh what are the plans for sharing out the data from analysis throughout the season? Well, our, our, what we're looking for is we're going to take the data, mask who it comes from, and kind of generally uh, give it to a university or give it to somebody who wants to do research on it. It will be available. Again, we will mask names. There will be no names. Regions um, will be available uh, to the researchers that want to look at this data or anybody really wants to look at this data. We really haven't thought about who's going to get it, but it will be available. So it sounds like a research project for the council, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Great. All right, well, I am out of questions. These are all the questions which I had in my book. So um, is there, it's, are, are there any other questions which I kind of missed? I don't think there were others from the chat, but if anyone wants to open up their mic or ask questions out loud or add them in the chat, please feel free as we have a little bit of time. The growers are being very shy. <laughs> Going once, no further questions. Debbie, they just want their refractometers. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's my <laughs> turn. All right, yeah, I'm the giveaway lady. So um, so a couple of things. First of all, um, all of the resources from this uh, whole program, including this recording and uh, the PowerPoint presentations which, as PDF files is being posted on the Muscadine Grape Association website at the link that I uh, sent out earlier, sent in the email to you that came with the Zoom and will continue to, to send to you again. Um, in that area, well, okay, so we are offering through this program free testing, as people have said, to North Carolina wineries and vineyards. Um, and we're trying to figure out just based on our budget and what people want, sort of how many samples we can do for everybody. Uh, we know that everybody who is interested is not on this call. Um, we know some people signed up and didn't make it. And we know some other folks just haven't gotten around to it. So we're gonna be trying to find out from you folks uh, in North Carolina, what you think you want. Uh, and then figure out how much we can do. Um, and to do that, I've created a Google form that you can fill out that asks for your address, because if you sign up for this, you know we didn't actually ask for you for your name and address, so we don't necessarily know who you are. Um, and we'll ask you how many samples you think you might want to send to for the InnoFoss uh, analysis. Um, you know, if you have a lot of different blocks and a lot of different varieties and you want to do it three times, it might be a, a lot. You know, if you're a small vineyard, you've only got one one block and they're all pretty much the same. It might just be three. It might just be one. I don't know. Um, people will have to pay their own shipping charges if they're shipping. So, you know, you're talking probably at least five or $6 a box to, to send these by UPS, maybe $15 a box. Um, it's not much, they're very light. You have to bun bunch it up. We also hope if we can, that we will send you those cutesy little um, sample cups 
that uh, Renee showed a picture of, and uh, I think that uh, uh, Nadia did also, um, we can buy them in bulk and we can put them in a Ziploc bag and send you a batch of them. Um, and if we can't, or if you're paying for samples on your own, it's easy to get little um, like uh, uh, oh, Ziploc brand or whatever, little screw on uh, food containers at Target or Walmart or, you know, some grocery, they come in little four pack, um, in four to a pack and they cost maybe three, three or four dollars. You could probably use other small containers as long as they're clean and as long as they seal. You don't want to send them in, a, you know, something where the juice might leak out. I mean, you could use a water bottle. It's a lot bigger than you need. You only have to put a small amount in it. It's going to float around a lot. And it's got a small mouth and it's harder to get in. So if you are doing it on your own, you can, you can just buy your own containers. Or if we're really nice, we'll send you some, especially if you're a Muscadine Association member out of state. Um, so th that uh, particular form will be posted on that site, um, along with uh, uh, instructions for sampling and some forms that you can print out and use to send with your samples. So we've got that all ready. And I was just waiting until after this um, webinar to finalize it and post it up there. Um, That'd be a quick question. I think uh, maybe Chuck covered it. How many milliliters or ounces does Chuck need in the jar? Does it need to be completely full? Or It, 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 it really doesn't. Um, but we do need a representative sample of, of that. And at least, you know, as you saw the video, we're using three mils, but we really want 40, 50 mils. If you're freezing it, obviously you need to leave some room in there for the expansion for freezing. So, you know, if we can get 40 mils, that's absolutely plenty. Could you translate that cups, please, for those of us who are not scientific in our thinking? Um, that's two, like a quarter uh, of a cup, right? It's like well. three or four tablespoons. Okay. It's not a lot. Um. So we've got that information on the instructions so you know how much you need to send. Uh, and it's perfectly all right to send a lot of air along with it as long as you send enough. Um, other other so questions to comment about that? It's 1.3 to 1.6 fluid ounces. Does that help? Okay. So a cup is eight ounces. So it's it's less than a yeah it's less it's a you know it's less than an eighth of a cup or a quarter of a cup it's less less than a quarter of a cup, um, yeah that, that's very helpful for me, um, so we'll be posting that there and um, we'll we'll let you know uh, what what we're doing but you have to fill out that form or contact me by email so we know you want us to do the samples and the form also asks if you want a refractometer. We, through this program, are able to provide those handheld refractometers to growers in North Carolina who want one. You know, if you already got five of them, you don't need one. If you want one, use that Google form to tell us you want one and we'll send you one. Um, uh, we also include on there some information about how you can get one yourself if you happen not to be able to qualify for this program. Or if you want to upgrade to a digital refractometer, um, there's a suggestion for that. And also some other equipment that has been recommended by our uh, fine scientists here that you might want to have um, if you want to take a closer look at, at, your, at your grapes and what they're doing. Um, so watch for that. I will for sure send you some uh, an email again with that with the, those links. Um, but they've been in the chat as well. Our next session is next Wednesday. We're going to have sessions each Wednesday throughout July, um, again at ten or ten thirty in the morning um, on Wednesdays. Um, the next one focuses on harvest and some of the relationships between, uh, say, if you're having custom harvest. Um, relationships between the grower and the harvester, and also potential buyers for grapes if you're selling your grapes. Um, and also um, we'll give an opportunity for folks to talk about how they harvest, how they 
again, when they when they decide to harvest some of the ins and outs of that. And if you uh, will have some buyers on to talk who are looking for grapes to talk about what they're looking for and how they like to work with um, with growers. Uh, so if you're looking to sell grapes or if you're looking to buy grapes, that will be an opportunity to have some interaction with people. Um, again, that's next Wednesday, the, the 21st. Uh, the one after that will focus on lab equipment, um, uh, you know, what, what you need in your winery lab. Questions? I guess that's pretty much it for me. Yep. All right. Um, well, if there are not no more questions, this is your very last chance to ask any question to any of the panelists. Or um, if not, then uh, we will uh, um, thank everybody for your time and thank all the speakers for the, your, your really good presentations. I think it was very helpful. Um, I think we had some good discussions and thank you Debbie for organizing it. Thank you Kyle for hosting it. And thank you everyone for your time. And um, I, we will see you next week uh, at the same time, same place. All right, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.